I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about Douglas Adams' Dirk Gently. But before we get to that, a few things as always. First of all, we want to send out our warmest thank you to our newest Patreon patron, Michael Wombat. Not exactly his real name, but an old and dear online friend of ours. So thank you so much for helping support us on Patreon. Please feel free to check out the Patreon page, patreon.com slash The Endless Knot, if you'd like to help support us as well. Thank you, Wombat. And also, be sure to check out Wombat's own writing. He's a great fiction writer. Uh, you can look at cubicscats.wordpress.com or search Wombat Author on Facebook. And you, it's really worth your time. There's lots that's fascinating to read there. Second, just a reminder to check out hashtag Humanities Podcasts. To find more great podcasts on humanities themes, language, literature, history, more and more people have been joining in on that hashtag, and there's some great podcasts that you can find now, so be sure to check that out. And then finally, before we get going, cocktails. So we're both having the same cocktail for once. And it was my suggestion. We looked and looked for more Douglas Adam themed things, but we neither had the ingredients for nor the courage for a pangalactic gargle blaster. So we've ended up drinking a French connection. Because all things are connected. Interconnected even. Yeah, I think that'll become obvious, the theme element of that as we can go along. Except we're not really drinking French connections because French connections are made with cognac and amaretto. These are made with brandy and amaretto and not even a particularly good brandy because we're cheap. <laughs> well, that's what we had. I could have lied to you. I could have told you it was cognac and amaretto and sounded even classier, but we would never do that. We would never lie about what we're <laughs> drinking. <laughs> All right. So cheers. Cheers. Oh, cheers. these glasses are heavy. Not because of they're so full, but they're heavy glasses. <laughs> Check out the picture that I'll post. <laughs> You'll understand why. Here's to the interconnectedness of all things. Mm, tastes classy. It's a nice classic cocktail. Mm. All right. Today we're talking about Dirk Gently. So let me give you a few background details about the Dirk Gently novels and the adaptations that we're going to be talking about. First of all, if you don't want any spoilers for the plot, we probably will give some. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the plot, but I'm sure things will come up. So if you really want to read the books or watch the adaptations, the miniseries, without any spoilers at all, you'll have to put this podcast aside for the moment. Do go read the books. <laughs> if you don't want to read the books or can't remember all the details of the plot, which would be totally understandable because it's very complicated, I'm not going to summarize the plot now. It's not worth it. Because even Douglas Adams himself would probably find it difficult to accurately summarize the plot. He is on record as saying that on rereading it, he couldn't quite figure out how the ending of the Holistic Detective Agency <laughs> worked. <laughs> but you can go to Wikipedia and the, both, the summary for both Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency and Long Dog Tea Time of the Soul are there if you want to refresh your memory on the details. So Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, written by Douglas Adams, was published in 1987. And the sequel, Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul, was published the next year in 1988. These are humorous detective stories. I think we'll talk about genre in a few minutes with the central character of Dirk Gently. An adaptation was made called Dirk Gently that starred Stephen Mangan in the title role. The pilot was broadcast on BBC Four in 2010 and then a three episode series was broadcast in 2012. And then most recently, and one of the reasons we're doing this now, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency is a BBC America series written by Max Landis, starring Samuel Barnett as the detective Dirk Gently and Elijah Wood as his reluctant sidekick Todd. And it began airing in October 2016. And we've watched two episodes of it so far. And for those of you in North America, by the way, it is on BBC America and you can watch it there. If you are outside of the U.S., it will be on Netflix, but not until December. It will start being available in December. Yeah. So if you well, have I think probably the entire season will probably go up in December. Yeah. Right. Or you can purchase it on uh, iTunes, iTunes, which is how we've been watching yeah. it. Yeah. So as I said, the plot is too complicated of either novel. <laughs> 
to or even, of the, the television series. Of the t- yes, to even begin to explain. But the most important element, and the one I want to start with, is what holistic detective agency means and what a holistic detective is. And that is Dirk Gently's basic tenet about the world. When he introduces himself, he says he's a holistic detective and that holistic detection is a based on the fundamental interconnectedness of all things. And his theory is that that interconnectedness will lead him to the truth about mysteries by following up seemingly unrelated elements, leads, people, events, wandering through life, and somehow everything will lead him in the end to the solution he's looking for because everything is interconnected. So that's sort of a very, very (laughs) basic summary and something that does not do justice to it. But one of the reasons that we wanted to talk about this for the podcast is because of the obvious connection if you'll excuse the term, between Dirk Gently's view of the world, however humorous <laughs> and bizarre and outlandish it is, and this podcast and the videos that Mark makes. So, Mark, let me ask you, this co- concept of holistic detection, this idea of the interconnectedness of all things, was it actually an inspiration to you? What is the connection to what you do? Well, it certainly was. I've been a Douglas Adams fan for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So before Dirk Gently, Mm -hmm. I was reading the Hitchhiker books and watching the TV show and listening to the audios. And so when the Dirk Gently series came out, it was this great new thing for me, you know, by Mm -hmm. one of my favorite authors. Suddenly there was a new, totally new series, a new thing. Mm -hmm. And so I immediately leapt on it. And so it's been part of my life for a very long time. Since 1987, 1987. Yeah. basically. It has certainly been an influence on me, mm-hmm. um, and it spoke to a certain part of my soul. Finally, there was someone who, who looked at the world the, the way that, that I always wanted to, right. in this kind of connected way. Mm-hmm. And so it, it very much spoke to me in a kind of crazy, over-the-top way. Right, yes. Because Dirk Gently, if you haven't read the books is not portrayed as fully understanding what he claims to do yes he walks a fine line between being a fraud and being a crazy person and being an idiot savant that he stumbles into things without really fully understanding it or being someone who actually understands this Mm -hmm. theory of his and they walks this line all the way through and you're never quite clear on how he fits into the world that he perceives well and indeed he he sort of applies quite ludicrously quantum theory to a classical system which any physicist would say this is this doesn't make sense right right and frequently he he will come across other people who sort of actually understand the the physics of it and he bristles let's say when people call him on it people call him on it but he applies this idea of sort of quantum uncertainty to the normal large macro level mm-hmm. of the world and then people mm-hmm. point out that he's wrong and yet he gets results yeah and it's a sort of satire on the i suppose on the bad science right even the use of the holistic which yeah which of course has become a term and was in the 80s mm-hmm. already a term of pseudoscience where everybody was all about holistic things that just treat right. That didn't really mean anything. Mm-hmm. So when he uses it, it conjures up these ideas of aromatherapy mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. sort of hippie things. Mm-hmm. And yet that's not at all what he ends up doing. And yet I've ventured into those waters Yourself. In some, myself yeah. in some ways, applying the some of these notions of interconnectedness mm-hmm. uh, in, in the larger world. Yeah. Well, and as I said in the books, he does succeed. Yes. In spite of the fact that everything he says doesn't make any real sense. Yes. <laughs> And he does find the the universe finds him the answers. Mm-hmm. So the idea that everything is interconnected obviously has a link to what you've been doing with yeah. the attempt to find connections between things in the videos and what we've been doing in the podcast, asking people about unexpected connections and things like that. I don't want to compare ourselves to Dirk Gently <laughs> <laughs> uh, for a number of reasons, really, but... <laughs> But yeah, the idea that we're open to the possibility that things that seem unrelated may nonetheless be connected connected. in a meaningful way. In a meaningful way, yeah. Yeah. And that will actually give us a a larger sense of the world. I think that one of the things that happens with Dirk Gently is, is much of what has happened with Hitchhiker's Guide. I mean, Hitchhiker's is, in the same vein, a ludicrous story. 
and the yeah. philosophy expounded within it is self-consciously ridiculous again and again and again. And yet people have made mm -hmm. much of what is in Hitchhiker's Guide uh, very central to their life experience. You know, there's people who to whom elements of it, like the um, perspective vortex mm -hmm. or uh, the ideas about life, the universe and everything... Those things are meaningful to them, even though they're, it's obviously a humorous book that is ridiculous on the face of it. Well, as with all good science fiction, it reflects more of our contemporary world than anything else. Mm -hmm. That is really at the heart of what science fiction does. Is It's a mirror to the contemporary world. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing is with Douglas Adams is he's not just science fiction, he's humor. He's humor, yeah. That's now, true. you can argue the same thing about good, good humor. Good humor is a reflection of, yeah. Good comedy is always yeah. about finding underlying, or not always, but is often about fun finding underlying truths and meaningful statements cloaked in ridiculousness. So to say that Dirk Gently has influenced you is really no odder than to say that Hitchhikers has influenced many people, yeah. which it has. Mm -hmm. However silly it is and however self-conscious people sometimes are about claiming it, there's a lot of people out there who want to know where their towel is, think that the number 42 has a lot of significance, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things. So fair enough. There certainly are other central elements to the Dirk Gently novels. novels. Let's stick to the novels for the moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. that specifically intersected with my interests and mm -hmm. predilections. <laughs> Time travel in the first novel. Right, right, which is something you've always been interested yeah. in. Yeah, and so you know, if you are unaware, my my doctoral dissertation was looking at time time in Old English and how it was conceptualized and linguistically structured and culturally constructed. Yes, yeah, so the first novel hinges on, as it turns out, uh, time travel and time travel paradoxes mm -hmm. and the idea of changing timelines mm -hmm. and, and going back to reverse things that mm -hmm. have happened in the past and the complications that arise from that. And of course, one of my earliest obsessions, I guess you could say, was Doctor Who, which we'll come back to, but obviously Douglas Adams was connected to that. Mm -hmm. And then the third sort of hinge mm -hmm. in the second novel was, of course, Norse myth, mm -hmm. Thor being one of the major characters of that novel. Mm -hmm. uh, and Odin. And Odin. And, of course, you know, being a medievalist who specializes in northern Germanic culture, obviously, this was influential to me. Mm -hmm. And fun to read about the way he plays on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. You still haven't read American Gods, have you? I still have not read American I Gods. I have the audiobook. <laughs> I'm going to make you listen to the audiobook. It's long, but you will love it. Sorry, that was a tangent. But speaking of Thor and Odin, mm -hmm. you really need to. And I, I know you've wondered, you know, is there... A, a direct connection there with Douglas Adams, with Douglas yeah, Adams. and and with those specific, there may well be. I don't know. I haven't read about Gaiman's connections to Douglas Adams, but there's no way he isn't connected in mm -hmm. some way to it. That that world is too small. Okay, so those are some of the reasons why that novel, those novels, were important to you. I'll just say that I read them. I don't remember when I read them first. They didn't have a strong, they didn't make a strong impression on me other than I enjoyed them. So I don't have a sort of my life work is connected to them story <laughs> <laughs> like you do. But I read them early on and I enjoyed them. And I've got to say that in some ways I think I like Dirk Gently better than I like Hitchhikers. As novels, they're better. They're better. Oh, yeah, they're better yeah. novels. Mm -hmm. And I just think that they appeal to me a little bit more than Hitchhikers. Hitchhikers is so scattered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's because I, I primarily consumed them as novels. Right. If I'd come to the audio versions first, I might have, like the radio play versions, I might have liked Hitchhikers better. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about then is the genre of the novels. Right. Because I think one of the things that's interesting about them is how they genre bend. Even when you look at Wikipedia and they say they're humorous, detective, science fiction yeah. novels. Well, and, and the, the back cover blurb on the, the novels themselves play with this mm -hmm. bizarre... What do you call them? Yeah. What do you call them? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and they're not even both the same because the first one is really mostly a science fiction one. It has the electric monk, it has time mm -hmm. travel has space aliens and spaceships. The second one is fantasy. Yeah. 
because it's got the gods, it's all about Valhalla and the Norse gods and mm-hmm. Norse gods on Earth. And it doesn't really have any science fiction elements to it. No. There's no technology elements to it. It's all about gods mm-hmm. and myth. So even the two novels themselves are already two different, but they're both crosses because they're both detective novels crossed with something else. Yeah. And then they're also both humorous, which is another twist on the genre. Mm-hmm. Now, humorous detective novels are not unusual. Humorous science, science fiction, fiction is, is certainly not. not Douglas Adams is key to the humorous science yes. fiction genre. But nonetheless, I think they are they're interesting because of the way they play with that. And they play with those tropes, too. Because the idea that he's a private detective, he's always confounding and then fulfilling people's expectations about what a detective is. Right. The idea of being a private detective. I mean, that line used, I think, in both of the adaptations yes. straight from the novel. Yeah. You don't you, look like a private detective. If the you first look like, rule of being a private detective is not to look like a private detective. Yes, exactly. And that idea that he has to not be like what a fictional private detective looks yeah. like. And yet he has a secretary and an office and, you know, th- mm-hmm. there's all, all these the things of, that he yeah. th- does have and the d- name on the door and all of that stuff. I mean, Adams has always played with genre conventions. Yeah. And that's a big part of what Hitchhikers is, is playing with what are the conventions of science fiction and then subverting subverting or taking them to their logical but ludicrous extreme. And I think in some ways Dirk gently is like that. Yeah. Take the idea of the bumbling private detective to its ludicrous extreme. And that does make sense within books that are focused on the idea of connection, that they are connected genres, that he's he doesn't work with only one genre. Right. That would be sort of antithetical to the idea of this kind of random connections between things. You don't know at any moment in the story whether you're in a detective novel, a humor novel, or a science fiction novel, or a fantasy novel. Okay, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the concept of adaptation, because we want to move towards the reason we're talking about this now is because of the new adaptation. So the idea of adaptation is, I think Adams is a really interesting person to think about whenever you think about adaptation from one medium to another. And the first thing to think about is that Adams was always adapting his own work. Yes, that's true. And as a writer, if you've read his posthumously published collection of things, the Salmon of Doubt, I think it's in there, but in, in interviews and other places as well, he talks about, you know, the writing process for him. And he was, you know, someone who had, I, I guess this is a common experience with writers, but a bit, a bit of a love-hate relationship with the process of writing. Right. And so he's the sort of writer that, you know, it doesn't surprise you that he would immediately leap on something he's already written as source material for something new he's about to write on because Mm -hmm. it makes the job easier. Mm -hmm. So specifically with Dirk Gently, the history of the Dirk Gently novel is the history of him adapting his own work. Yes. It was based on largely two Doctor Who episodes that he wrote. Mm -hmm. So he he had a several year history connected with Doctor Who. He wrote a couple of scripts, first of all, and he worked for one year as the script editor, also contributing scripts while editing scripts. And basically the first Dirk Gently novel is an amalgamation of two scripts that he, two Doctor Who scripts, one of which never saw air. Right, not in the initial run. Not it's in the initial on, run. issued on DVD. In its incomplete form, mm-hmm. because due to a strike, it was never completed, never aired, so it was only partially filmed. So it's not surprising he decided to cannibalize it so he for cannibalized something else because it, yeah. it wasn't like anybody had seen it yeah. and it was work he'd done, so mm-hmm. why not use it? So that, that was Shada, the last program he worked on for the series. Which was from the Tom Baker years. All of his uh, work on Doctor Who was in during the Tom Baker era. The second script he wrote for Doctor Who was City of Death. Mm-hmm. And it also contains elements that were recycled for the first Dirk Dantley novel. Yeah. Specifically the idea of an alien who in the distant past blew up his ship and was trapped on Earth. Thereby... And- Creating life on Earth. Yeah, thereby creating life on Earth and needing to use time travel to free himself. Mm -hmm. Or to fix the error. Fix the error, yes. Yeah, so that's fundamental to the Dirk Gently stories and was at the heart of the City of Death story. With actually very little change to that part of it. That part of it, yes, quite the mechanism for the time travel was quite different. So instead of inventing time travel technology, the alien just happens to come across 
somebody who has someone has a time machine in Dirk Gently. In yeah. Dirk Gently, yeah. yeah. That element comes from Shada, the alien with a time, time machine time. as his rooms in Cambridge Oxbridge yeah. office. Yeah. And in Doctor Who in Shada, it was a Time Lord, a Time Lord who exiled retired Time Lord or to, uh, retired time, time to Lord. Earth and as a. But he removes, of course, that element of it for yeah. Dirk Gently. It's just, it's never, ex- we're never told why the guy has no, a time travel. it's never explained. No. He just, Well, and the explanation is he's so old he doesn't remember himself. Right. He just. <laughs> he's been there so long he's forgotten. He's forgotten. Where it came from. Yeah. So those two stories then form the basis for Dirk Gently, but by no means the whole story. No, I mean, no. There's he... lots of important stuff, and, like the whole character of Dirk Gently. And this is the funny thing, is that, you know, in terms of Douglas Adams recycling elements, he'll recycle elements, and then he'll add a mind-boggling number of new elements mm-hmm. that make you wonder why he would need to, you know, recycle elements in the first place. Because his inventiveness yeah. is so over the top that he will come up with so many new ideas. I almost feel sometimes that it's not so much that he couldn't come up with new things and needed to recycle as he loved he the loved ideas the he'd idea come up with. And just and, wanted to use it. Yeah. And in particular with Shada, yeah. he, he hadn't got to use it. Yeah. He, and then also with City of Death, you know, mm-hmm. come up, that, he, that he comes up with ideas and he likes them. So he wants to keep trying at them. Yeah. And I mean, that's, of course, the story of Hitchhikers, too. Yeah. He comes up with Hitchhikers. He does it as it was a radio play first. Mm-hmm. And then he turns it into books. And then it's another radio play. And then he was involved in, in other adaptations. And every time he does it, it's not that he can't think of new ideas, because he adds new ideas every time, but that he loves the ideas. It's like a composer who keeps wanting to do new variations on the, the theme. same theme yeah because he liked the theme yeah no one who's read douglas adams can think that it's because he had a dearth of material no <laughs> because he, he, he always has too much yeah <laughs> and in fact i mean if there's any criticism, uh, criticism you mm-hmm. could make of his work is that he just has too many ideas packed into the yeah. you know and i mean dirk gently is a bit like that mm-hmm. especially when i reread them it had been ages since i'd i'd read it and so i reread it before we did this and I, I was trying to remember which bits were in which of the novels mm-hmm. and how they all went together. And there was this too much, mm-hmm. actually. There's too many different characters. There's too many ideas. There's many too another many writer di- would have sp- spun that out into five different books. And in some ways, they would have been better books, I think, maybe, if he had met, you know, if he had mm-hmm. written three books instead of one. Mm-hmm for her, the holistic detective agency not all of them necessarily with Dirk Gently like some of the st- some of the storylines and the ideas are fabulous and interesting and didn't really get like even the whole thing about Gordon w- Ray's computer programs and the way the right. computer programs he made were being used by the American government to in shady ways like there's a whole thing about this this millionaire Gordon Ray and his computer programs it's irrelevant to the plot. Yeah. It actually does not, in the end, matter. Basically, all that matters is he's a guy who got killed. Well, I suppose one of the computer programs relates to the, the aliens at the end of the the idea of converting the raw data of the universe into music. True, I suppose so. Though that's the computer program that that's not the one Gordon Ray not, does. Not it's the, the one, one that, yeah, that's the one that uh, Richard... The Richard McDuff has been working on. So the fact that Richard McDuff is a programmer Yes. is at least relevant. Yeah. But all the stuff about Gordon Ray's brilliant ideas and the way he was thinking about it and the way the governments were trying to use his programs, and it doesn't matter. Like a, a whole bunch of what is constructed into his very interesting personality is actually entirely irrelevant mm. to the plot. But it's there, and I mean, it adds to the color of the novel and everything. But it could almost be its whole own story. And it's just there because clearly Adams had this great idea and he stuck it in there and it's fine. It, it, it's not that it detracts from the novel, except that it just it, it does feel overstuffed sometimes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul is a little less like that. It's, it's more much, tightly constructed. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's got one major story. Mm-hmm. And while for the first little while you don't know how all the elements connect, in the end, they all do connect in a fairly tight way. Though there are some elements that do seem throwaway there, like the I Ching calculator. Which makes a, a brief appearance <laughs> and is just really cool, but isn't really central to anything. No, that's more about Dirk Gently characterization, yeah. I suppose, than anything else. Yeah. But you could see that as being the MacGuffin to a, a whole, a whole other plot. novel yeah. in itself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so Adams adapted his own work, and he in fact adapted something that had been a TV series, a TV script, yeah. into a novel. Yeah. So he was already, and he'd already, with Hitchhiker's gone from radio play to novel, 
So he was already working from one medium to another and fully aware, presumably, of the yeah. differences, mm -hmm. how you do those things. So the question is, we're going to turn now to the two adaptations that we wanted to talk about, that we watched recently ourselves. The first question, and this really relates to what we were just saying about the overstuffedness of the Holistic Detective Agency in particular, is can that novel actually be in another medium? Because what I think we want, what we're going to want to talk about is how you adapt Douglas Adams. Yeah. And I mean, we could talk about that with Hitchhikers, but I think we should focus on Dirk Gently. But it's the same question, really, with Hitchhikers. Yeah. Can that novel be a TV show or a movie without substantial changes? Mm -hmm. And I think that part of that is about, for instance, the narrative technique, especially yeah. with Dirk Gently. Yeah. There's a very fractured narrative technique to it where you move between stories mm -hmm in a very, what seems to be a very disjointed way until finally they kind of come together. All join up, yeah. Now, it's not impossible to do that in a movie. TV shows, it's a little they, harder. Yeah, they tend to be a bit more linear. Yeah, because there's only, especially if you've only got a half hour and an hour, Yeah. how many different focalized narratives can you have without it becoming completely impossible to follow? So those stories, I mean, there's a great urge to take something as beloved as Douglas Adams and turn it into another medium. We know the way that TV works these days. Any property that's already got a name recognition is going to people, somebody's going to want to turn that into something that they can put on TV. So the fundamental question with Adams is, can you adapt him? Yeah. And if you adapt him, what do you have to do to make that work? And I think what that gets to and why Adams is interesting is the question of what is adaptation? Mm -hmm. What happens when you adapt a novel to another medium and what counts as adaptation? You know, what's mm -hmm. what's fair game? What's allowed? What can you do? And I have to say, I think Adams himself, having worked in, you know, multiple media, mm -hmm. was keenly aware of this problem and would certainly not have slavishly adapted those novels if he were writing the adaptation. Yeah. He would not in any way feel bound to... Constrained to follow constrained it in some sort of it. really yeah. literal or, or faithful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the question of what is a faithful adaptation... And what counts as faithful, how you should transfer mm -hmm. it. I absolutely agree. I think he would be, I can't imagine him being somebody who would be upset that his precious story had been no. changed. Yeah. You know, that, that doesn't make mm -hmm. sense of the way he worked with his own work. Mm -hmm. So let's turn first to the 2010 adaptation. So we watched that recently. It had been out for a while, but we had not seen it before. And there were the four episodes, yeah. four hour long episodes. So first question, how did you like it? I loved it. I, th I thought it was amazing. Yeah. It was very Douglas Adams. Yeah. So there's two questions. How was it as a show and how was it as an adaptation? I agree. I really enjoyed it too. Mm -hmm. I really liked it. I'm sad there's not more of it. Yeah. Yeah. It was very much in Douglas Adams, like leaving aside the specifics of those novels, mm -hmm. it was very much a TV show that Douglas Adams would have written. written. Could he have written it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It felt that way to me as mm -hmm. well. Let's do a little recap. What did it use and didn't it use in general from the stories? How did it work? The pilot episode used definite story elements, mm -hmm. a lot of them. Mm -hmm. It was by no means a literal adaptation. It didn't stick to the details of the plot, but it kept a lot of elements in it. It kept several of the characters, obviously Dirk, Richard McDuff and Susan. Yeah. All of those. And Gordon. Gordon. Though the relationship was different. The relationship between Gordon and Susan was changed into an ex-girlfriend, boyfriend relationship instead Rather of sister. Than, yeah. Brother. And there were a whole bunch of other changes. But the basic elements were the time machine element. Yeah. And the missing cat. The missing cat. <laughs> he was hired to find a missing cat. The mysterious death by explosion. <laughs> right. <laughs> So there's a lot of stuff that's kept the same, but the whole Cambridge plot doesn't it happen. It doesn't happen. No. And all of the alien exploded ship, that none of that happens. None of that happens. And, and never yeah. does in the whole story. But the idea of time travel and going back and changing things yes. does. I agree. I thought it was, frankly, a delightful series. Yes. Like, it was funny and it was pleasurable to mm -hmm. watch. And Dirk Gently was brilliantly cast. He was mm -hmm. really good. Mm -hmm. The utter self-centeredness, as well as the charmingness and infuriatingness of him. Yes. And the sort of clumsy 
oddness of him. All of those things were really, really well captured. What it did was it turned it into a possible serialized story. Right. And so a lot of things were changed, like the way Macduff ends up as his partner in the yeah. in the detective agency that has nothing to do with the books. But it was necessary for a sort of a continual series right. for being able to do more stuff. And then we it didn't use Tea Time of the Soul. No. Really. No. Not that first episode. Or did any of the rest of it? There's a few elements from Tea Time of the Soul that, that the crop up. The fridge turns up, doesn't it? The fridge turns up. And also the element of him being hired by someone who's worried about being killed. And then that person and being killed. And then him being late to, uh, to, the appointment. to the appointment. And then when he gets there, he finds him dead. Right. And then having to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. But it's a very, but it's a completely different plot but from that point from on. From that yeah. point on. Yeah. And none of the Norse God stuff. No, none of the Norse So I would say that what the adaptation did is it removed not completely but mostly removed the science fiction elements there was a time machine though they add other science fiction elements interesting yes that's so, true there's the time machine and then they add the ai all the yeah uh, stuff in a later episode mm -hmm. they they have a, an artificial intelligence and yeah so they removed some of the science fiction that the alien science fiction elements yeah, yeah. The guy with the time machine, it, he builds it himself. He doesn't find an alien who has it, and there's no other alien involved. So all of the alien elements they remove, they move it into more of the sort of possible near future science fiction. Mm -hmm. The idea of things, uh, technologies that could be exist, could be created in the near future, which is a different type of science fiction than the Dirk Gently novel originally had, which was an alien mm -hmm. science fiction. But it completely removes any of the fantasy elements. There's no fantasy. There's nothing spiritual or mythic or religious or gods in any of it. Other than his sort of generalized belief that the universe is somehow helping him. Yeah. Okay, so that was that adaptation. And I agree. I really enjoyed it. I wish there were more of it, frankly. Quite happy to watch a whole bunch more of those. <laughs> it was very clearly based on the novels. And there are lots of lines yeah. Yeah. taken from the stories. And the characterization and tone of it mm -hmm. were very close, very close yeah. to the novels. But the writers clearly thought there's no way that this Those story, stories this could story be. doesn't yeah. work no. as a set of TV shows. And I think they're probably right. Like, yeah. I, I can't really I could maybe imagine it as a movie. It would be a weird movie. And you'd have to really you'd buy in. You'd have to change a lot of things. and Well, and I think also you'd have to have an audience who's ready to buy in. And, and yeah. I don't think you can rely yeah. on that. The movies cost so much now. You can't rely on an audience that's ready for it. Right. I mean, if you think back on how they did the Hitchhiker's movie. Right. They had to smooth a lot of stuff out. I mean, they kept a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But they had to smooth a lot out because they couldn't rely on an audience who was ready to follow them into the weirdnesses of that story. Right. Because my movies cost too much. And the movie of... <laughs> holistic detective agency would cost a lot because it would need a lot of effects in fact yeah, yeah. so it would be hard and ghosts <laughs> and aliens but it did it really succeeded to me as an adaptation okay so the next one was the 2016 adaptation that is currently happening and we can't give a final verdict on this because we're in the middle of watching it We've only watched two episodes. In fact, there's probably one. Yes. We're recording we on a Sunday night, so there's probably one available for us now that we can watch tonight, in fact. Yep. Suddenly thinking we should have recorded this tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> when we'd watched the third episode because we've only watched two episodes. But still, this is quite a different adaptation. Yeah. So what do you think of this one? I think it relies a lot less on the source material. Mm-hmm. It's taking very core elements about genre yeah, and kind of running with that. So the idea of quirky sci-fi. Right. It's taking the idea of quirky sci-fi and running with that and not relying too much on the specifics of the Dirk Gently character mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the Dirk Gently world very much and creating something very new yes it's definitely new i would argue that in some ways it is there's certain fundamental aspects of the dirk gently world that are fundamental to this i mean the interconnectedness issue the interconnectedness it is very is, much yeah. 
focused so far around the idea that un seemingly unrelated events are deeply connected mm -hmm. in a way that's almost more interconnected than Dirk Gently. Mm -hmm. I think maybe in a sort of misreading of it, because I feel like the Dirk Gently idea of interconnectedness is that there is a random interconnection that nonetheless leads to a pattern of meaning. Right. Whereas so far, and we're only two episodes in, maybe we'll have to report mm -hmm. back once we've watched the whole thing. So far, I feel like what's happening with the new one is a more intentional interconnectedness. Yeah. That things are interconnected in a way that we do not yet know, but will be revealed as being interconnected. Mm -hmm but that they're actually deliberately mm -hmm. interconnected, that they've been deliberately mm -hmm. connected by some larger forces. And that somehow the characters are being sort of tugged along by... Some larger force. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that in a way, it feels like the writers, or the writer, Max Landis, thinks that that's being very faithful to the Dirk Gently idea, but to me feels like a bit of a fundamental misunderstanding of the Dirk Gently idea. Right. That it's not that there is an unseen hand that mm -hmm. connects everything, but that in fact random it events are, yeah. are, are randomly connected, and that that somehow, that if you can see that pattern, it provides meaning, but not because anything is directing them to be connected. But I have to reserve judgment a bit on that. And I mean, that's my view of what Dirk Gently means. I don't control what that narrative says, no, right? No, like it, somebody else yeah, is allowed can... to take a different meaning from it. And, and that doesn't mean I don't want to watch what they mm -hmm. take out of it. So, But I do think it's an interesting take on that sort of fundamental, because it, it does feel like what's underneath that story that we're being given in mm. this so far is an attempt anyway to replicate that basic worldview. Yeah. So um, in a way, I think it, that's what I would say is that it, it is an attempt to be the Douglas Adams, Dirk Gently worldview. Hmm. It may not be what I think that worldview is, but I do think it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's trying to be faithful to that worldview. Yeah. I think the oddest thing about it is there doesn't seem to be a Dirk Gently in it, in a sense. As you say, it, it may be trying to follow the worldview, mm -hmm. but the Dirk Gently character is so radically different. So how is he radically different? I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I've been mm -hmm. just trying to put my finger on it. Well, Dirk Gently in the novels is grumpy. Yes. And grumpy and fundamentally lazy. And lazy. Yeah. I think that's the thing that when I first saw the trailers for it, I thought this, this Dirk Gently is really frenetic and active. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in the novels, he's just his fundamental approach to things is laziness. The, yeah, the le path of least resistance. To and I mean, he says that yeah. it's not a criticism of mm -hmm. him. It's just his actual self-evaluation even. Mm -hmm. And this one in the, no in the adaptation is very high mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that he takes himself and everything very seriously. In the, in the novels. novels. Yeah. He doesn't think he's a joke. No. He's aware other people think he's a joke. Yes. And that makes him sort of depressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I think Hitchhikers is like this too. Arthur Dent is a depressed character. You know, like he's mm -hmm. he's sad. He's sort of, his life is sort of grim. Mm -hmm. His fundamental worldview is fairly sort of pessimistic. Mm -hmm. And Dirk Gently is also generally pessimistic and generally depressed. I'm thinking of the Hitchhikers movie in particular. Mm. They don't really portray Arthur Dent that way because who wants to watch a whole movie, a whole Hollywood movie with a character, right. a main character who's sort of just generally bewildered and depressed? I mean, there's elements of it, but they don't, I don't think, play it up. And I think that's the same with Dirk Gently. The earlier adaptation, even it, mm. made him a little less world weary and world weary and cynical and mm -hmm. lazy mm -hmm. because that's one thing it's one thing to read a novel with that it's another thing to watch that on screen mm -hmm. and i think this one in particular i mean it's be made for bbc america so it's made with an american audience in mind and it just feels to me like they thought we can't do that that's not that's not somebody anyone's going to want to right. watch we can't have somebody who's just sort of slobby and sloppy. That's the yeah. other thing about Dirk Gently. Like physically, yeah. in the novels, he's sloppy and sort of untidy. And yeah. That's not at all how yeah. he's represented in, in this adaptation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you like it? Well, as a TV show in its own right, if you yeah. disconnect it from its source material, it's very striking yeah. uh, and visually and narratively engaging. Mm-hmm. Very hard not to care about it very fast. Mm -hmm. 
I think it hooks you in really fast. So, I mean, it's, I think it has high entertainment value. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's good. Yes. I think it's well done. And I mm -hmm. think it's good. Both of us have been somewhat traumatized by watching it. Yes. <laughs> we don't it's have... It's a very, it has sort of the, the kind of dark comedy mm -hmm. element to it. And I do think that that is, I mean, it's funny because if you think about the novel, like especially Gordon Ray is shot for literally no yeah. reason. Yeah. I mean, people are killed. Um, Michael, the the editor of the newspaper, yeah, goes off and, yeah. and kills someone. Yeah. Again, totally mm -hmm. like there's no excuse for it. Just to prove he can do Just it. Just to prove he yeah. can do it. If you go on to the other ones. With the, the beheaded. <laughs> yeah, there, there are the, be, the guy. beheaded guy. And then there's uh, the plane that comes down and kills those two marketing people. Right. The eagle yeah. that turns back into mm -hmm. a plane. It's very confusing. So, I mean, there are actually quite a lot of people who died. Mm -hmm. It is quite bloody. Mm -hmm. But because it's a novel and because of the way it's just, it, they don't dwell on the sort of horror of it, it doesn't feel so grim. So I was going to say that it seems un Adamsy because it's so violent. To a certain extent, that's probably unfair because there is, in fact, quite a lot of violence yeah. in the original novels. But they don't feel violent because it's not dwelled on and it's not visual and all the rest of it. So it does feel grimmer and mm -hmm. scarier, this new mm -hmm. one. So it's odd to say that the Dirk Gently character doesn't seem sad or grumpy enough, while at the same time the overall story seems too grim mm -hmm. and serious. Well, by way of comparison, I suppose you could, you could point to the fact that the earlier television mm -hmm. adaptation mm -hmm. had deaths. Yeah, and, it does. And, and kind of grim humor deaths even with yeah. the with the old woman in the first, in the pilot episode, yeah. the old woman clubbing the uh, her husband or whatever. Her husband and then also Gordon to yeah, death. Yeah, Gordon just because he happened to wander in at the wrong moment. Yeah, and then seemed to try to poison, poison them all and then kill herself. And, yeah. and yeah, no, it's all, it's, so there it's is a kind of black comedy at the, at the best, yeah. Yeah, I think the new one is more shockingly, viscerally, yeah upsetting characters tied up and locked up and mm -hmm. beaten and there's a certain brutality there's to a it. great amount of brutality to it that has not yet been fully paid off we don't fully understand where it's all going but i mean that girl who's been locked mm -hmm. up and kept and beaten in a room i mean that's that's hard to see and then the scary holistic serial killer yes who's terrifying but i will also say it is funny yes i mean there is very it's funny. not just it's not just some black humor. Mm -hmm. It's though I think there was more humor in the first episode than in the second. Mm -hmm. I felt like the second episode didn't have as much humor in it and seemed a lot grimmer. Mm -hmm. So I think I think it raises this one even more than the second one raises interesting questions about adaptation. Mm -hmm. It's not made completely clear, but I think the premise from a bit that they drop in the first episode is that we're to understand that the first the, the Dirk Gently and his holistic detective agency and the long deck tea time of the soul have already happened yeah and now Dirk Gently has come to LA somehow after those things have happened so these are the continuing adventures of Dirk Gently yeah right so it's not replacing those stories no they've already happened but now nothing because nothing that's happening has anything to do with the plot no they yeah. They haven't borrowed any elements whatsoever from and it. That, I think, is, is a, a kind of sensible yeah. move to make. Yeah. You know, if you're going to try to do something with, with the series mm -hmm. to just leave the, the novels behind mm -hmm. and take the premise and... And run with it. Run yeah. With it I don't, I don't have a problem with that. And, but I do think it's interesting to see how that is done then, to take this idea, you know, because what it, what it raises when you do that is the question of what is the Dirk Gently series? What defines it? Mm -hmm. You know, in what way is this still the same series? If you adapt something, but you don't keep any of its plot mm -hmm. or any of its characters except one, wherein lies the adaptation? And, and I don't mean mm -hmm. that to be that that isn't an adaptation. I mean, I don't think it isn't. I, I think it's it in can a way be. it's not an ad adaptation more. It's a sequel mm -hmm. in a sense. You could think mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. But even so, what it forces you to do is to sort of define what is what is the core 
of the original property right. that makes this anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think this is like, I mean, there is the occasional Hollywood adaptation or whatever, where they literally just take the title yeah. Yeah. of a work that exists, slap it on another movie, and quite literally you cannot find any point mm -hmm. of connection. Mm -hmm. I may disagree with this interpretation of Dirk Gently, but I don't feel that about this. Uh, do you? No, no. I don't feel like they've just said, hey, here's a property. Let's take the name and put it on another work and just write, you know, we'll write whatever we want to write mm -hmm. and we'll just call it Dirk Gently. I don't think that's... No, I think they were inspired by the mm -hmm. original material. And they're trying to write a story in that world. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I'm, I'm not sure I buy their interpretation of that world, but I, as far as I can tell, it's an honest attempt yeah. to write in that world. But... It, makes me then say okay well what do i think is the essence of dirk gently that makes this a, a version of that world and not just something with that name attached right does it just come down to things are interconnected and certain genre elements as well mm -hmm. uh it's a detective story mm -hmm. a sci-fi detective story mm -hmm. humorous yeah there are the elements of randomness and random chance yeah. that are focused. I mean, they they have taken lines. In line, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, he, he, again, has this line about, you don't look like a detective, mm -hmm. for instance. And his method of navigation. Right. Wait, has that come up in this one? I'm not sure it actually has. Actually. Or maybe maybe it was his counterpart, the holistic assassin. She said, yeah, I, I can't remember does, if it was exactly has, his. That line. So Zen navigation is... You find some other driver who looks like he knows where he's going and you just follow him and that'll get you where you're supposed to go, even if it wasn't where you were intending to go. That's Dirk Gently's method of Zen navigation. I think she uses some ver she uses, variation of yeah. that. I can't remember exactly how it worked. It wasn't exactly that, but she does something mm -hmm. along those lines. And I mean, all the way she's been saying, I'll end up wherever I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. If I kill someone, I was supposed to kill them. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. end up where I'm supposed to be no matter what. And that kind mm -hmm. of is that Zen idea. And that's one, actually one of the things that struck me as a little bit wrong about Dirk's character is mm -hmm. that he has that same element. He, he feels driven to solve the cases that he needs to solve because the universe told him to. Told him to. And the Dirk Gently of the novels is very much self-centered. Yeah. Right? He only is working on other people's cases because he wants to get, he needs some money. Yeah. Yeah. He's in it for himself. You know, mm -hmm. he's, mm -hmm. what can I get out of this? How much can I get paid? And Though he does, in both the novels, he ends up with feelings of guilt. Yeah. So maybe not as much in Holistic Detective Agency. In Tea Time of the Soul, he takes on the case for this crazy guy who thinks he's being chased by a guy with a, a demon with a side mm -hmm. that is like, yeah, whatever, I'll take your money. And it's all yes, excited about the money. Feel like he's and then once he's failed case, him and yeah. the man is killed, he does yeah. feel guilt. Yeah. And he is driven essentially by guilt to fix that mm -hmm. for much of the storyline. But it is sort of but portrayed he's as an, about it. <laughs> yes, and it is portrayed as sort of an unusual feeling for him to mm -hmm. feel like he owes him something. Yeah, this sort of um, righteousness, it's not quite the right word, that the mm -hmm. new adaptation has doesn't feel completely true to the mm -hmm. character i agree the dirk gently character is so english mm -hmm. in things like that sort of generalized depression vague cynicism defeatedness about the world generalized guilt without it being completely focalized on anything a sort of slight grayness i mean the whole idea of the long dark tea time of the soul the, right. that feeling you get on a sunday afternoon mm -hmm. when life stretches in a sort of wearying way and while the, the character in the new adaptation is English, mm -hmm. he's not that kind of an English. He's no. not an 80s English. I no. think there's a, a very specific cultural moment that Dirk Gently is part of. He's a different kind of sort of hip English, ironic, comedic, what the Americans think the English is. Yeah. English. And this may be a function of its production mm -hmm. background. Yeah, context. I think so. Context. It, it does feel that way to me. It's not the same kind of... It's. It's an Englishman as portrayed by non-Englishmen. Yeah. As opposed to, now I'm saying this as somebody who's not English, so I may be wrong, but as opposed to what seems to me in the Douglas Adams version as a very interior, from the inside out portrayal of what a certain kind of English national character is. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, you're getting there into some, some very precise issues of characterization. And that kind of stuff almost never makes it in an adaptation from one thing to a next. Is the writer British? The writer is Max Landis, and he's born in L.A. in 85. 
Hmm. You know, he's known for a number of interesting things, comic books, directing and other other things. But yeah, he's not British. Hmm. And he's he's born only two years before this book came out. So right. he also doesn't have that context. On the other hand, you're making an, a series for now. For now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> does trying to portray somebody in 1988 Britain really make sense for putting it on the screen for an American audience? Probably not. Mm-hmm. I mean, just because that's the image and the the feeling that I have about the story doesn't mean that it's the right idea. And that comes back to the idea of adaptation. What is the purpose of an adaptation? Mm -hmm. If it were completely faithful, it might be quite bad. Yeah. You know, it might just not work. Yeah. I'm not disagreeing with the idea that you have to change things for sure. Mm -hmm. And as we said, I don't think Adams would disagree with that. No. Yeah. In fact, I kind of think that the interesting question to ask is the metric that I've started using on our Shakespeare podcast about adaptation because after all (laughs) we have a whole other podcast that's all about adapting from one medium to another and on it I've started feeling like the measure of a good adaptation from Shakespeare anyway is that a good adaptation reveals something new about its source material helps you see its source material in a different way Mm -hmm. as opposed to whether you end up with a good movie or whatever that that's a different criteria and I think we've already said that the new adaptation for sure is an is a good production on its own terms Not as an adaptation, but as a show. It's a good show. And I think the 2010 one was also a good show. So is either or are both of them, though, good adaptations if you use the criterion of does it reveal something new about the source material? You don't have to agree with that as a criterion, but I think it's an interesting one to ask. And I was trying to think of what the central idea in a sense of, mm-hmm. and I can come up with one definitive answer, but, it, you know, it seemed to me the that one of the major themes of that, that ties both novels together mm-hmm. is the sort of divide between belief and rational understanding. Yeah. So you've yeah. got the monk, okay. right, yeah. who is a machine mm-hmm. created to believe things. So that no right? one else has to so bother no believing them. And then in the second novel, you've got the gods who, who exist because they're sort of believed in. Mm-hmm. And when they're no longer believed in, they sort of vaguely fade away. And new things can be created because of belief in them. Yeah. Belief is a force. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then all the way along, you've got this contrast between what Dirk believes about the world and what can be rationally proved, proved. about the yeah. world, which yeah. in the end, what he believes ends up being rash- being true mm-hmm. often, though all rational proof was against it. Mm-hmm. And this is particularly interesting given the, the sort of specific background to Douglas Adams himself Mm -hmm. um apparently richard dawkins Mm -hmm. the uh noted atheist noted atheist (laughs) as well as scientist apparently was a big fan of the novels and you know read the first novel and immediately reread it Mm -hmm. um (laughs) trying no doubtless to figure out what the hell happened (laughs) in it yes and apparently douglas adams introduced dawkins to the woman that would become dawkins's uh, wife lala ward oh my goodness i (laughs) forgotten about that connection who actress who played romana (laughs) who was briefly married to tom Tom baker Baker. yeah (laughs) (laughs) oh lord yes go on and so the it you know there's that interesting connection of rationality and skepticism and belief Mm, and emotionalism Mm -hmm. and emotionalism but yeah so what does what does this say about 1980s ideas about belief and rationality yeah. as opposed to 21st century uh, Yeah, so ideas if you compare about... the novel to the adaptations, mm-hmm. yeah. That's one of the things, because we haven't seen the whole arc of the story yet, and because, of course, like everything written in a post-X-Files Buffy universe, this story is obviously going to have a big overarching arc mm-hmm. to it. There's a force behind what's happening. That's already becoming clear. And it probably has to do with government. Yes. In this new adaptation. Almost certainly has to do with government. And, to be fair, in the 2010 one... There's also a nod to that. Yeah, there's also an unseen government force Mm -hmm. behind things that is absolutely not there, except in one... There was a small element of that in the Dirk Gently novel. The software being being yes. used, yeah. yeah, but it's very much a tiny, it's, it's a, a throwaway away, thing. Yeah. It, it doesn't drive any of the plot, but there's mm-hmm. this idea that Gordon Ray has produced a software that's so good at manufacturing reasons for actions that the government bought up all copies of the software and yeah. has not let anybody else use it, the American government, mm-hmm. 
and has been using it to manufacture reasons for everything they've done since. Yeah. But it's that's sort of a fertile imagination moment, not it, it it's irrelevant to the rest of the action. Yeah. Whereas in the 2010 one, there's some suggestion, well, more than a suggestion, mm-hmm. that there's actually sort of FBI or CIA yeah. tracking Dirk Gently yeah. and involved with him in some form. And then in this new one, there's some sort of governmental agency that seems to Knew possibly all have about him and created, created him, him, maybe, or, or yeah. created the assassin. Mm-hmm. We, uh, I suspect it's created him and the assassin, but mm-hmm. we'll have to wait and see. So that certainly, I think reflects on the differences between 1980s and current assumptions about what what the rational and irrational and the seen and unseen forces in the universe are. Mm -hmm. Adams is teetering between religion and science. Mm -hmm. Now religion doesn't even enter into it. Mm -hmm. There's no religion at all in either either of the adaptations. No myth. No. Not really any of the Zen idea. Not the universe isn't really or Dirk Gently in the newest one thinks it's the universe, but we as audience are being told, no, it's not the universe. It's yeah. some governmental force or yeah, something. This, uh, the idea that both he and the um, the holistic assassin say that they're being pulled about like a leaf on the wind or something is the metaphor. They yeah, use. and they seem to think it's the universe driving them, but we were shown at the end of the second episode that it was probably, maybe they were bred or trained mm-hmm. or some sort of, anyway. So there's some other darker force behind them Mm -hmm. and i think that that definitely reveals something about the culture no question about Mm -hmm. it whether it reveals something about the source material i I suppose it does because it highlights the difference between those sort of what are the unseen forces and what are the the non-rational elements of those first two books as opposed to what they are now by changing them it throws that into relief to some mm-hmm. extent then it does it does show us something about those novels that i might not have picked up on without it being changed right i think in a way the 2010 adaptation was a really nice version i don't know that it did anything to change my views of the books no yeah you know, that's so, a good point yeah for better and for worse yeah it, it, it didn't even though many of the details were changed overall it nestled fairly nicely into my mm-hmm feelings about the books Mm -hmm. this newer one is much more radically different in terms of its tone and feel and i have yet to know exactly what it does but i suspect it will change my attitude toward Mm -hmm. the book more or at least will give me another layer it certainly has the potential to add a lot more if it we'll see where it goes i think it's it's taking it's making more of the material and maybe asking bigger questions or trying to make different stories out of it Mm. in a way that the other one didn't so much but I think this one does have potential for a more radical reexamination of mm. some of the issues that are at the heart of Dirk Gently. But I don't know yet whether I'm going to agree with the answers. Right. But that doesn't make me angry at it. I don't think it's wrong to take this approach to it. Mm-hmm. Not, not that I in general feel really that anyone has the right to say somebody's wrong to take an approach to adapting, even if I don't like it. I'm interested in seeing what they do with it. Mm-hmm. I feel like it has gone already quite a lot further away from the original novels. Yeah. But I'm I'm open to the possibility that it will not loop back to the novels. I don't think it's going to do that. No, yeah. But that it will give me more to think about in terms of those original novels. Mm-hmm. So I think really we should leave it there and perhaps in some follow-up once we've watched the end of its six episodes, right? Eight episodes. Eight episodes. Yeah. Okay. So maybe a while. It'll take us into December. Right. So when we finished watching it, I think we might take a few minutes at the beginning of some episode to just update you on what we thought of the whole series, because I don't know, there's a lot still to go, so we'll have to see what we think of it by the end of it. In the meantime, though, we'll leave it there, and I would definitely be interested in hearing opinions about the series if you are watching it, the BBC America series, and any thoughts that anyone has on the novels or the previous series, please Get in touch. Let us know what you think. Indeed. Tell us what silly misinterpretation of the whole (laughs) thing we've done. How we're wrong. So for our next episode, we will be coming up to American Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So we'll be taking on last year's Thanksgiving video on Turkey Mm -hmm. and the etymology of Turkey and what that tells us more broadly about Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So we'll have that coming out, I hope, just before Thanksgiving. And until then, we'll be watching Dirk Gently.